Paper Room, what's good? Yep. We're here. Thanks for tuning in to episode 29. Wow. We are Almost getting into 30. our 30. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, that's pretty good for like podcasts. Kind of old. Some people like, they stop after like five. Yeah. Way to go, guys. But sometimes when I see like episode 100 and something like oh. on podcast, I get a little intimidated. Overwhelmed. You can yeah. do it. I just, no, no, no. I believe we can oh, do it. Yeah. It's just like, it's a lot. It's like mm. you have to catch up on so much content. Yeah. yeah that's true but we're not there yet and so we're excited for today i am your co-host ish mcgee joined by our killer uh young adult staff megan and pastor danny Whoop. we're excited and um i'm super excited for this episode just because i get to ask you both questions mm. um although we serve on the same team it's just really cool to get each other's opinions and insights about stuff um and i feel like this is going to be a really good i do want to say right before we start uh that if you're watching we are not sponsored by stanley (sighs) yeah just disclaimer don't look at the cup don't don't look at it it holds great water and ice (laughs) great water and ice (laughs) there's megan's commercial (laughs) all right so um if you're tuning in for maybe the first time or um you have no idea what we're doing what we're talking about uh the paper room exists because we have a desire to help young adults live their life as they follow jesus um and that can actually be a very difficult thing to do especially as a young adult because there's just a ton of things going on um people are in school or they're trying to graduate school or they're trying to find a job or they're maybe getting a full-time job and now their schedule's changing um there's just a lot of life happening Mm. i feel like between the time that you graduate high school and before you turn 30 like so much is happening Mm. um and so our desire is to help young adults really focus on jesus and how to live out their lives honoring god um through all of that kind of ups and downs of of their journey um and so we hope that through you know these topics that we talk about um that we hope to encourage and lift up young adults um and give them a sense of empowerment also to go out and live out what they're learning um impacting the culture that's around them so before we get into our topic for today i have a little segment a little interactive game for us to play um so this is it's super easy it's just something fun to go along with our topic for today so this is a true and false true (gasps) or false game okay oh i like so i'm gonna give you true and false about ourselves or just in general so i mm -hmm, instruction so (laughs) i'm gonna give you all a random fact of history or culture got it and you're gonna guess whether or not it actually happened or if it's false Ready, Goisha. So ready. Number one. A Roman emperor once wanted his horse companion to be elected part of government office. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> uh, say it one more time. A Roman emperor wanted his horse companion to be elected part of government office. I mean, to me, it's that's such a random statement that it just sounds true. Like, like, like it could be true. I don't oh. think it could be true. I, I just think it is true because it's so specific. Okay. So I say true. I think true too. You don't have to copy me. <laughs> <laughs> Those were I I, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that. You know, you were thinking about the Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking like that would make sense. Like I can see someone doing that. Like in power, being like, yeah, you know, I want you my do horse. Whatever you want. Yeah, okay. exactly. I can't see that, but that's I just a think good reason. Specific. Actually, I just think it's too specific to be false. So it is true. Whoa. And actually little tidbit uh that roman emperor was deemed very violent and schizophrenic and paranoid so oh no yeah he he really thought his horse had yeah you know he really believed in him yeah he did all right second one during world war one paris planners thought about building a fake paris to trick bombers i think false bro Mm. i don't know about that um i'm gonna say true also that seems like a solid strategy. Okay. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Because World War One, like you don't really have like a whole lot of images of what things might look like, and so mm-hmm. yeah, that is true. Oh, oh wrong. it's true. I'm winning. That they were like, you know, Dude, we one. have no other option here. Right. What can What can we do to survive? And that's. that's I just feel like for do. some reason that would be like in history textbooks or none about. It, it I, probably was. Oh, I probably didn't. You didn't pay attention, making <laughs> that page was ripped out of the history textbook. <laughs> okay. This one is more like pop culture. 
Wendy Williams claimed back in 2011 that she caught Beyonce's baby bump to be <sighs> fake in an Australian interview. That has... To- I'm going to go with like how Danny said in the first one. I feel like that's so specific that it just has, has, has to be true. I'm going to go false because uh, I just want to win. So oh. I have to pick a different. Wait, what did you pick? False. Oh, okay. And yeah. you said that it was true that I said true. Yeah. was fake. That's actually false. Boom. Oh my goodness. It, it wasn't <laughs> fake. I had no reason. For and she be. had to like say, guys, it yeah. wasn't fake. Mm. <gasps> oh, yeah. oh, so that's how she announced she was pregnant. I, I guess. Dang, actually. that's crazy. I don't, I don't know too much about, about Beyonce. Wait, is this how you, like, you're not making an announcement, are you? <gasps> <gasps> Me. Oh. We had to like, throw Ben in here Yeah, somehow. there he is. Shout out, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ben. Okay, next one. There's only two more left. Okay, I can't really read Roman numerals, but King <laughs> Louis the... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> King Louis the XV <laughs> had be- he had become a leper and was kidnapping children so that he could bathe in their blood. Bathe oh. in their blood? This is historical, okay? At the time, bathing in the blood of children was thought to be like an effective leprosy oh, cure. Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, wait. So you're saying if that's true or false? Yeah. Uh, true. If, if, if what you said historically is that's what they thought in the culture i'll go with true so the first two were true then it was false wait what? oh, oh so you can't do that no i'm just saying of elimination. like all of them could be b we've had a lot of true. i really even we haven't them up had so a lot that... of false but i don't think you do back-to-back false i'm gonna go true let's see what happens so you both say true mm-hmm. yes that is false oh man but bro. This one has like a teeny ounce of truth just because authorities were, oh, so I was right they were kidnapping children, but it Not wasn't, it reason. wasn't him and it wasn't for that reason. It wasn't. To Did the you just like make up the, no, I had to oh, like look up blood, things in history. Yeah, no, I, I would not have been able to make that up. You just like Googled like. Historical. Don't ask me what okay, I, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like crazy rumors that people thought oh were my true. Gosh. Uh, okay. Last one. Megan may or may not know this one. So it's just, you know, I had to give her like a little bit of an edge. You know, she's our guest and everything. One Direction fans. <gasps> <laughs> Gosh. I don't know like who One Direction is. One, Di- one Direction fans created a conspiracy theory in 2016 that Louis Tomlinson's son didn't actually exist and that he had photoshopped a random baby into his pictures. <sighs> Who's Louis Tomlinson? Okay, so He's the band consisted of, the band. of Harry... Louis, Liam, Niall, Zane. So Louis was one of the members. Okay. Boy band. Yeah. And he had a son already? I thought they were like teenagers. Well, now they're like now they're know, like forty. They're like late twenties, early thirties, I think. So and, he had a son. Okay. And the fans just made up a conspiracy theory that the baby was fake. In pictures. Like there were other conspiracy theories. That one I don't remember. I mean, I can I can see fans making that yeah. any conspiracy theory. Someone say true. No, but I do think true because I do remember everyone was like shocked. Like they're like, "There's no way he had a kid." Hmm. Hmm. That's weird. Yeah. Like no one just believed it's that. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Boom. Yeah. I got four out of five. I'll take it. I got two out of five. Very, <laughs> very good, you guys. So the point of that game was that you just can't. Listen to what the media has to say. True. I mean, it, it, that's 100% it's true. true you girl. can't just listen to everything that you hear. Check your sources. But uh, you can listen to what the paper room has to say because, you know, we always root our yeah. truth in God's word. Amen. It's not our truth. It's God's truth. All right. So today, speaking of culture and just the world, um, we've talked about a lot of different topics on the paper room like relationships and our relationship with god um just brought up different questions that people asked maybe at move conference or um on our instagram um but today we are talking about culture and what it looks like to be involved in culture as a christ follower whether or not you should be involved how much you should be involved how much you should engage in the culture um and what i mean by that is anything that's outside of the church because if somebody is following jesus then you're you're in a culture right like you're in christian culture um whatever that looks like for your church um but there's also 
a totally different kind of culture everywhere you go based on um you know who you're with where you're at what city you live in all of those things um so first question what is culture um because i feel like we can define it a bunch of different ways and it'll all mean the same thing or you know um be a good definition but is it good or bad what is culture uh yeah so i i love the topic of culture um and and you just think about from the very beginning god created us right and mm -hmm. then obviously genesis 3 happens and then all of a sudden everything just goes downhill uh our sin caused us to then pursue selfish desires versus godly desires uh and then you get further into genesis and then you get to the story of the tower of babel right they're trying to build like the highest tower possible for themselves to make it their name great uh, God changes their language and all of a sudden now they can't understand each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really think that it was kind of at that moment that culture kind of started getting created because mm -hmm. culture is essentially uh, like uh, different norms that happen within a specific like group of people, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's like the formation of a group of people from race, ethnicity, um, even uh, socioeconomically, and kind of the things that they do of their uh, ideologies, their philosophies, the way they mm -hmm. think inwardly and how then it becomes outwardly expressed, mm. right? And so it's, to kind of summarize all that, it's it's uh, the creation that God has put together of people who then form inward philosophies to then mm. express outwardly, right? Mm. Uh, and so you can look at culture and just see um, the way it's expressed in multiple ways. Obviously, if you go uh, to a very diversity, you can just see culture kind of everywhere. Uh, if, you, uh, if you live in a more like a suburban area, like you're kind of like, you don't see culture as much. Uh, but I will say this, because uh, I, I love the way culture is expressed. Uh, I guess it, it seems very like like colorful, right? Mm. If you go like to, if you look at different parts of the world, mm. uh, different areas have different. I'm just thinking textbooks, like right. in elementary school, like mm -hmm. the different colors and yeah. everything that's so different. One of the most beautiful moments that we got to see uh, when we lived in New York, um, obviously New York City, diverse area. It's a lot of people, a lot of cultures. Like Queens has. 120 nations represented into one neighborhood. Um, but one of the coolest moments, and I'm not really a fan of this, but um, some people love this sport, uh, AKA our sound engineer, uh, is soccer, right? <laughs> uh, the World Cup in Astoria was like one of the most beautiful things because wow. everybody is celebrating where they're from. Mm -hmm. So like you walk down a street and you just see flags and all kinds of celebration and things taking place. Mm. Uh, and it was, and people like just really supporting where they're from yeah. and, you know, kind of sporting that out, whether in hats or shirts or literally wearing a flag around their neck and just walking down the streets. And it was just really uh, cool to kind of see that, that people are expressing where they're from. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, um, it really touches every aspect. And then when you think about really more like Western cult, so that, I guess that was like worldly culture. Mm -hmm. Now more Western culture where we live in now, uh, what it becomes is, uh, is ideologies of, of what people have kind of over time started to think. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we lived in a culture at one point where uh, truth was, um, you know, the most uh, the most expressed form of yourself. I guess mm -hmm. like there is an actual truth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether you went to church or not, you kind of believed in some sort of higher truth. Now truth is expressed towards the individual, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a remarkable book um, by a guy named Carl Truman where he just kind of lays out what happened from like the moment of the sexual revolution to like now of how everything was expressed by expressive individualism. So now rather than mm -hmm. having like a centralized truth, it's like what's true for you might not mm -hmm. be true yeah. for me, yeah. what's true for you might not be true. So, so that kind of bleeds in. So one of your questions was, is culture good or bad? Mm -hmm. um, it's both, right? Uh, it can be bad when everything is totally expressed by, you know, if you have a culture where one person is extremely overbearing and overpowerful mm -hmm. of everybody, aka Roman Empire, uh, then it's bad for the people who live there, right? Um, and then it can seem good where culture is like, everybody is on their own, like mm -hmm. believe what you want to believe, but then spiritually that could be very bad, right? Mm -hmm. So it just kind of depends, but yeah. Right, yeah. I think um, also yeah. it becomes dangerous when you make it your identity mm -hmm. um, because that's not, that's not godly, mm -hmm. that's not that's what good. he had for you. Your identity is founded in him and um, that's what he sets forth, you know, mm. not what the culture says about you, but what God says about you. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Um, I actually didn't think about that, but yeah, as I asked that question, like, is it good or bad? Um, like you're saying, like it could really be based on the person. Like mm -hmm. everyone will have a thought of whether or not your culture or the culture that they see in front of them is good or bad based on what they 
believe is right what they believe should be you know a good culture um and it's almost like when we like we've talked about mission trips like before you know we're talking about new york and different things but it's almost like if we were to you know go to africa for you know the togo mission trip and walk in and completely like bring our mm. culture into theirs yeah. like, and that's where the danger lies is, right. is when you especially when it comes to obviously we're talking about in the sense of biblical mm -hmm. uh, reality and our job as believers of jesus so much of what happens in missions is let's make them like us versus let's mm. make them like jesus right? yeah and so we want them to be western mm -hmm. you know, americanized really uh, and that's where it gets really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Which is why I love what Megan brought up is, you know, like if we're really talking about, you know, we're talking about Jesus here um, and biblical culture and how we can look like Jesus every single day. Um, then our goal should be to create a culture that invites people in to know Jesus mm -hmm. and not invites people in to know our preferences and everything like that. So um, before Jesus, before y'all met Christ or maybe even like when you were first coming into the world of Christianity, like what did culture look like for you? What were those experiences like? I think in high school, I definitely was looking to the culture for my identity and what I could benefit from it mm. and what could they could offer me. Um, meaning my culture in high school was high school. So that meant parties, mm. that meant relationships, yeah. that meant guys, that meant my friendships, that meant popularity. Um, and that was very, very important to me. It was important to me that I had a boyfriend. It was important to me that I upstood my social status. And it was important to me that the culture could offer me something. Um, and I think I ran with that way too far into destruction, mm. um, where it led me into a path of switching my identity constantly of, mm. well, this guy couldn't fulfill me. Um, and our relationship didn't last long. And he took my everything of, I put my everything into him. Um, and for a moment of time, he was my identity, but that ended. So like, let's move on to the next guy mm. or let's go to the next party or how can I be more popular or how can I um, get more Instagram followers? And that's a dangerous place to be when you're looking for something, when it can't provide to you that lasting water, when you're looking for something that can't provide that everlasting need. Um, it leaves you thirsty and it leaves you wanting more that can't be provided. Um, so definitely before I you know, took my faith seriously and Jesus became my whole identity. I was definitely looking for the culture of the eyes of me, the eyes of my flesh mm. and how can you feed my flesh and how can you feed the desires of what I want? Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was pretty much the same for me. Um, I mean, I became a Christian towards the end of my junior year of high school. So uh, when you're uh, a high school student in Texas, you do the same thing every single week, right? It's <laughs> it's you go to school, you're in relationships, you party on the weekends, you go to football games, you go to Whataburger. And that was just the yeah. the ongoing, extremely toxic culture uh, that we live in. Um, and and that just kind of forms your mindset that you think you have to have these certain things because mm. everybody else is doing it, mm -hmm. which that's the whole thing of ideologies and culture. It's outwardly expressed because everyone's trying to do this. So you have to do it also. So mm. it becomes really difficult to, to live differently in that world uh, because you just want to do what everyone else is doing yeah yeah, yeah that's crazy you don't want to look different yeah. um yeah i mean it's very similar for me as well like because i i didn't come to know christ until after i had graduated but it was that summer before college um and i think what's what's different for my story is that i was by myself when i came to know christ like i was just in my room and i didn't have a church community i didn't have um you know somebody to disciple me right then and there um uh, walking me through that journey so um it's almost like i went right into like what whatever culture was next for me after high school that was gonna be like oh, okay the, i guess this is how it's supposed to be mm. as a christian which was really i think kind of detrimental to my to my faith at the beginning because um i was just kind of walking in blind almost mm. i was having to teach myself what the bible meant and um very soon I did find BT, which I'm so grateful for. I think if I had just continued on by myself without a home church, it would have been so much worse. Mm. Um, but even then, like I was still discovering, you know, like I didn't know that we could say certain words here. Like I grew up not being able to say the word shut up and, you know, like, <laughs> cause I was bad, you know? Um, so I was still asking those questions to myself, like, okay, well, you know, if every single person here is following Jesus and they're a Christian, then I can do everything that they're doing. That was kind of my belief. So um, whatever culture I walked into here mm -hmm. was automatically what I believed to be the right culture. So um, 
I would I would want to bring up, you know, like even if you find yourself in a Christian culture, it doesn't always mean it's the best or yeah. the a good culture to be in. Um, but instead of you know, just walking away when I realized like things aren't right and the Holy Spirit was really tugging at my heart. Um, I stuck around not only because I saw good things in the culture, you know, I saw good people here, um, but I really desired a change. Like I, I wanted to help be a part of making where I was a part of better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for young adults, for anywhere that you are, even if you are, um, you know, at your job and you're really invested in the culture of the workplace that you're in, um, don't just quit. And I know mm -hmm. we've said that a while back before on the, on the paper room, but um, think about, is it possible that I can make this better? Mm -hmm. Not me, but Jesus through me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, you know, one of the big ideologies of our current culture in the Western world is, um, is like, do what makes you happy. Right. Or like, like whatever mm -hmm. feels good. And that has gotten extremely deep into the sense of when something is difficult, then we feel like I'm not happy here, so I got to leave, right? And, you know, you just look at all the stats of like how many different jobs that young adults take, you know, within a 10 year period, like, and part of the culture in the past is you just stuck it out and grinded no matter how bad it was, like in our parents' generation. Mm -hmm. So they just stayed at the same job for yeah. 35 years unhappy, right? And so, so I don't think it's either one of those extremes, but it's got to be something in the middle to where because you're not happy doesn't mean that God's not calling you there. Like right. maybe he's calling yeah. you to help make a difference there, right? Because, uh, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but but the reality is as a believer of Jesus, like you're called to be the salt and light in those spots. And so mm -hmm. how can you do that in the moments of difficulty, right? Uh, whether it's a church culture, a nonprofit organization, or an extremely secular organization that you're working in. Uh, how can you make a difference into that world versus wanting to just run away from something, right? right? Mm, yeah. Um, and so that that kind of plays into what I was saying in the beginning of ideologies will will form who you are. And so if one of the cultural messages that we're receiving is you do you, you be happy, everything is supposed to be like that, uh, then we're allowing cultural to to form us rather than Jesus mm -hmm. to form us. And so yeah. we have to be very careful with that. But. Exactly. And the part of the beauty of me staying, um, you know, where I kind of thought, mm, I'm not sure about everything, um, is that I've gotten to see our young adult ministry completely mm -hmm. like change and shift. Um, not necessarily like the foundations and the beliefs of it, but just the environment, the kind yeah. of the culture that we have built up. Um, and so uh, I love telling people that are new, you know, kind of maybe last two years um, that have come to our young adult ministry now, um, I'm like, I mean, it wasn't always like this. So, um, you know, it's it's always been based on Jesus. That's right. never changed. But just the different aspects of what we've built the culture to be has changed. So mm. for you all, like, how do you now look at our young adult ministry and, and thinking about, like, the culture that you were a part of before you knew Christ, like, that contrast? Like, how do you feel that our culture is defined at BT Young Adults, like, on a Tuesday? Hmm. Yeah, I actually want to hear from from you guys first because one, you're a young adult still. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the young adult pastor, so I I want to know. Mm. Are we doing a good job? Just kidding. <laughs> what, think, what do y'all think? I'm okay. gonna quit. I think for me, uh, which also my mic, like I messed it up, so <laughs> I don't know why oh my it's like goodness. falling. But I'm just gonna hold it. You got this. You're okay. Um, but I think for me, like BT Young Adults has been a huge help in my faith um, because when I first you know, high school going into this, I didn't know I was going to be here uh, mm. for college. I thought I was leaving. Mm. I thought yeah. I wasn't staying. Um, and Danny or Summer, a huge part of that story and creating that uh, environment. But BT Young Adults immediately became my family. It became my community. It became my home. It could be, it became a place where I could um, go and rest and find peace in Jesus. Um, and I think we've created a, an environment, an atmosphere where you know you belong there. And I know we say that a lot and it can come across as cheesy, um, but I think it's so special because, I mean, I think every person who came across Jesus felt like they belonged to him. Mm. And I want when people walk to that door to feel the presence of Jesus immediately through us. I want them to feel his radiating presence. I want them to feel their, his joy through our smiles. Um, and I feel like we have created that and we continue to foster that um, because we're letting the Holy Spirit work there. We're letting him move in. 
there's so many different people who attend young adults. There are so many different walks of life that come to mm-hmm. that door. There are new faces. There are new uh, people with different, you know, backgrounds of faith of, you know, I didn't grow up in the church or I'm new here. I'm not even from the Valley. I'm just mm-hmm. here because I'm an athlete. Yeah. Um, and they're scared to walk that door because they don't know what they're going to experience. They may have been judged by other mm-hmm. churches. They may have been judged by Christians. And it's scary to walk into an environment where you don't know what you're expecting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And so I give them props for for being uncomfortable and walking into that space. But thankfully, and through the grace of God, we've been able to create and foster a culture of love, mm-hmm. um, where when you walk through that door, you're not going to be judged, but you're going to be you're going to be welcomed with open arms of man we're so glad you're here and that you chose to spend this tuesday night with us Mm. um so it's been it's been awesome to see that growth and to be a part of it yeah i would say too like since i did get to see um you know it's even been called different things you know our Mm -hmm. young adult ministry but um before it is what it is now i think there were you know different age ranges even like just a few years ago um and if I could kind of define it before, I would probably just say that it felt safe, at least for me Mm. coming into it. um, You know, that was like my first experience of church community anyway. I was a young adult. So, um, you know, it it was still, it still blessed so many people. Um, But as I've watched our ministry grow and um, as I've seen Danny take take it over and really uh, take ownership of Mm. it, um it feels bold like it the culture of being to young adults on a tuesday to me feels almost like the like i have no other way to describe it except like this is how it's supposed to be yeah it's special. not that we're doing everything right yeah. not right. that this is the place to be and if you're not here then you're doing something wrong but this is how it's supposed to be done which is we're open like the doors open for anyone like you're saying um but also i'm thinking of like sometimes i'll be there on a tuesday and i'm used to it like i'm i live here at the church you know i'm here all the time um but i think of the person that's coming in for the first or second time Mm -hmm. and they walk in they feel everything you're saying you know i feel overwhelmed with the love of jesus i feel like everyone loves me here i'm welcomed i'm talked to i'm seen Mm -hmm. And that in itself can feel overwhelming. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. I think, why would we not want to overwhelm people with Jesus? Mm. You know, because we're not faking any of it. And that's like the goal. It's like we want Jesus to be so authentically known. We want his voice to be authentically heard. Um, And so that's how I feel that we've built the environment to be not just welcoming and not just like we're so glad you're here because we're all friends Mm -hmm. and we get to hang out and go eat after um but jesus is is the heartbeat Mm -hmm. of what we're doing Mm -hmm. and that's how every ministry should be yeah um so that's how i feel that culture has been i love it built Uh, on tuesday that's so cool to hear from you guys about that um yeah for for me um the when we thought about um it was i guess after covid and all the every ministry shut down whatever we we're like all right let's let's do something with the adults um the word that came to mind for me as we we're processing what to do was rest mm. like young adults are you guys are extremely busy you know you go to school for 15 hours and you have a job and you have a uh, family and friends and a relationship like and so what i didn't want to do was just add something else to your life right um and so my hope was if you come here, then you will experience Jesus and encounter some rest. Mm. Um, and, and that's kind of been the really the driving point of what I was hoping to create here. And I think I think we've kind of done that. And so part of me and and really my uh, passion for simplicity is I don't want to over structureize mm. this. I you mm. know I, I love that we have greeters. I also don't know if we need to like assign greeters all the time. Like just just let that be a part of your natural yeah. way of living out your relationship with Jesus. Um, and so that's, you know, as far as if you're in ministry, you know, there's a lot of production. There's a lot of, I don't mean like lights and sound. I, th- I mean, just like how you produce a service. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of organization. Like, I think all that's great. It's important. It's needed. Schedule people, all that stuff. To me, it's like, I, I think young adults prize the authenticity of, of everything. Mm-hmm. And so let's just try to be as raw, real, organic as possible. And that's what we try to do. So we'll see mm-hmm. uh, what, what else God does. But I feel like... Uh, definitely God is building something special and that's really to you guys young adults who show up every Tuesday to make it happen so. yeah love it mm-hmm. and y'all pull up pull up on Tuesdays come through 
We uh, want to see your face there. It is a loving culture. <laughs> so, as you guys have grown in your faith, um, switching over a little bit um, into just culture in general, like around us here in the valley where we're at, um, what has your journey been like as far as engaging yourself in the culture that's here? Um, you're both in ministry. So, while you're working in ministry, um, how often do you hang out with people that aren't here in the church? Um, what has that kind of grown into as you, your faith has grown stronger? Mm. Uh, well, yeah, I will preface by saying this. Like, if you're uh, a vocational minister, so, and if you desire to be in vocational ministry, meaning like this is your job, uh, it's really hard to engage with people outside of the church because mm-hmm. uh, you really have to make an extreme effort to do it. Because, like you said, we live here, we're always here, right? Mm-hmm. We're always interacting with other Christians because we're always at the church. Uh, which is why I love people who they're called to ministry, but not necessarily vocational ministry. Mm-hmm. Like, like you know that you're a believer of Jesus and you're going to reflect Jesus uh, at HEB, at a coffee shop, at your job, whatever. Because then you get to always hang out with non-believers. Uh, and part of that with uh, my story, as everyone knows, uh, but when I worked at a coffee shop in New York, like it was the best thing ever because I was constantly hanging out with non-believers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love that aspect. And now that I'm back full time at a church, it's a lot more effort to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, I have to like purposely um, organize things in a way that I'm going to interact with non-believers. So mm. a lot of times what I'll do is I'll purposely uh, work outside of the office and I'll just like, all right, I'm going to go post up at a coffee shop for a couple hours and work there just for that organic engagement that might happen with other people um, and, and try to do different things like that. Go and serve and do some outreach in different organizations. We're doing some cool work at the, at the campus at UTRGV and so trying to just purposely put myself in areas where I'm going to be able to interact with people that might not know Jesus or they might know Jesus, but they're not living that out. And so mm. how we can um, then help them continue to follow Jesus. So, uh, so it's hard, but it's, uh, it takes a lot of effort if you're a full-time pastor because mm-hmm. you're doing a lot of work here. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm still a senior, so I'm still, you know, on campus around, uh, non-believers and i think definitely the shift in mindset senior in college to clarify oh yeah in I'm college still in senior. Senior. i'm not kai yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go bulldogs um no yeah i'm a senior in college um and i think definitely the mindset the mindset uh shifted for me about like two years ago um i specifically last semester when i was on campus i had opportunity to you know have a lab group um and i before i would have you know just had that and been like okay this is my group but it was a perspective of I'm on mission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm coming here with uh, just having read my Bible, having be my word, and I'm in battle right now. Um, and there's spiritual warfare going on, and I'm here for a reason. And man, questions were asked. Mm-hmm. Uh, questions were definitely asked and noticed. And why are you different? And why are you so nice to me? And why why are you have like a light about you? I I know you're mm-hmm. different. You seem so innocent um, and so pure. And to me, it was just like, man, like, it's because of Jesus, man. Like, I'm like this because he changed my life. Um, And it was just a blessing to be able to put in that spot. And so I'm forever grateful for that. But now it's that perspective of now that I'm wanting to go into ministry, it's knowing that I'm on mission 24-7. And if you're not in ministry and you're still a Christian, I mean, you're still on mission. We're called to go make Mm -hmm. disciples. Mm -hmm. Um, But now it's my job and it's what I'm doing. And I have a passion for it because I want people to see uh, the love of Christ. And I've had opportunities now with this internship to, you know, be on campus more and to be around students who maybe this is their first time ever hearing about God. Um, and I always just try to be a welcoming spirit of have a smile of you can come talk to me. Um, and it's, it's going to be okay. And we can have conversations and there's not going to be any judgment there. Um, but let's help each other out and let me help you walk in your faith through those trials. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I will add to, um, because, you know, there's a tension of like, all right, I'm a Christian. I should not be involved in culture right? Mm. because culture is bad, whatever. Um, I love looking at the Apostle Paul, the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the journey of the starting of churches. And Paul was on this missionary journeys going from city to city to city. In Acts chapter 17, there's a story of Paul when he goes to Athens. Uh, and, and you I, you know, you see repeated words in the Bible. I think when, when it's repeated, it's important. Um, and there's a word that's repeated and it's observe. Like Paul is observing mm. the city. He's observing what they're worshiping, observing what they're reading. And he's going around before sharing the gospel, he's observing. Mm. Um, and then he uses his observation to then declare who mm. God is. Like 
you guys worship this unknown God, but let me tell you about the God who can be known, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if we're going to effectively share the gospel with the people that are around us, we have to go to them to mm. observe, to learn, to listen. Yeah. Like before Paul critiqued a culture, he was observing a culture mm -hmm. first. Uh, and so if we're going to do that, then we have to be able to learn who people are. Yeah. And, and, you know, not to continue to use New York, but I will. Uh, people move there for fame and for fortune. Like they want to go there to be known mm. and to to make a name for themselves in whatever industry that they're involved in, right? Uh, and so in that world, it's like, well, then how do you share the gospel with somebody who like that's their complete mm. mindset? Uh, the way you do that is like, okay, you're you're here for fame and fortune, so your your hope is that your name would be made known mm. or that your bank account would be full, whatever whatever the case would be. So now I know this is where they're finding their hope in. Like they're mm. finding their hope in some sort of uh, external reality. All right, well, let me show you about a greater hope that doesn't even rely on yeah. anything external, but it can be all internal, and now it can really affect how you change yourself externally and what you live out. Uh, and so you you learn how to share the gospel effectively when you learn people's culture. Mm. And so the way to do that is you got to go out and hang out with them. Right? Yeah. That's what Jesus did. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good segue into my next question, because as we get practical over the next few minutes, um, if somebody is listening and they're like, okay, I hear the call, you know, like I need to be friends with unbelievers. I need to kind of interact with unbelievers once in a while and not kind of shy myself away. Um, but how, since you worked in a coffee shop and you were with unbelievers all the time um, and you're at school, you know, on campus and you're saying that you're on mission, like how can somebody go out and do what they're called to do without completely, or even at, at least a little bit, you know, like giving in to what the culture mm. wants when it goes against what we believe, when it goes against what God desires for us. When I first read this question, um, 1 Peter 5, 8 came to mind, be sober-minded because there's an enemy prowling. Mm. Um, boundaries. Mm. Boundaries on. are so important. Um, if you're, A, I don't think that to love the culture, you have to be a part of it because that means you're not being sober-minded um, and you're giving into the temptations of the world, um, which can then give opportunity for your enemy to devour you. Um, and so that's just a real a real thing that we have an enemy who is lurking um but we also have a god who defeated that on the cross who has victory over that and that means he lives in the power of you mm. um which means that power reigns inside of you to be in the culture and to love mm. the culture with those protective boundaries um i think boundaries go way far than just setting a line i think they show people how real faith is mm. um because if That's you're good. willing to set boundaries if you're willing to say hey like i'm not gonna let you cross that it's not to say that hey i'm holier than you so i'm right. leaving this line here and you you can't come through it's saying no i have a god who loves me so much and i have found this eternal satisfaction that i don't want to mess that up i don't want to partake in that because that means that i'm crossing um what god has called me to mm. he's called me higher he's called me to be set apart he has called me to be holy because he is holy therefore i am holy and that means just living a life where you don't cross boundaries and you keep them up to protect you um to guard your heart to be on mission um because then when you're in the culture and you have those boundaries set up, people are going to ask questions. Mm -hmm. They may even mock you, but it's because they realize that there's something different there mm -hmm. and because they realize what you're doing may actually be correct. And, and it's they don't know how to respond to it. Yeah, sometimes. and yeah. it's making them fight their flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that Holy Spirit, you know, little knock comes in of like, you know, hey, maybe you shouldn't be drinking right now. And they don't want to, they don't want to put that aside because it's all they've ever known. So it's uncomfortable to then be like, man, I'm doing something wrong here. Um, and I mean, that's where you get to come in that conversation hopefully gets to happen of like, man, I've set these boundaries here because I found a God who loves me, but he can love you too. And these boundaries are so much better and so much more peaceful to me. And they guard my heart in such a way that it's never been found before because of the destruction of the world is just leading into a false advertisement of where your eternity is headed. Mm -hmm. um, and those boundaries are, are laid there to protect you, to be sober mind so that when those conversations occur, you're able to be in the right headspace to have them and not, um, you know, acting a fool. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that you said that because it, it that's another thing that I feel young adults aren't like, of course, myself included, like I'm a young adult. But um, it's something that we don't see very often is somebody actually living up to what they say. Yeah. You know, is actually someone... Um, living up to their word you know if they say well i believe this or i like to do this and then it like changes within yeah, a week because yeah. they meet somebody else or they you know our minds are constantly changing because people don't hold fast to what they believe so mm. that in itself is like it's different you're set apart by just believing in and living out what you say you believe for sure 
Yeah, I think of Romans 12 too. Uh, don't conform to this world, but be transformed mm. by the renewal of your mind. Uh, that phrase, be transformed, is a continual process until we get to Jesus, right? It's, it, that process never stops. And so if you're pursuing transformation, then you're ideally not conforming to the world around you. So, uh, But then you're also called to be the salt and light, right? Yeah. And so going back to like, as believers of Jesus, we need to be in areas where people don't know Jesus. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and one thing I see uh, in the culture of young adults that's kind of building over the past couple of years here in the Valley, uh, which I love, like young adults who are believers of Jesus hang out with young adults who are believers of Jesus. Like you go to a coffee shop and you see them all there hanging out together, studying the Bible, whatever. Um, they're all pulling up to each other's young adult groups and hangouts on events, whatever, which is awesome. Like, I love that. Mm. I think it's really powerful. Uh, but also on the other side of it, like light doesn't shine whenever it's just around more light. Mm. <laughs> it shines in darkness. Yeah. Right? And so if we're called to be salt and light, then we have to go to the areas where, mm. you know, darkness is um and so a couple of just uh things of advice that i would give is one uh if, if you choose to go somewhere where culture is taking place whatever whatever that culture like might look like for you uh don't go alone right yeah mm -hmm. uh jesus sent people out yeah, two by good. two mm -hmm. uh and with intentionality right mm. uh and so if you're like all right cool my friends are going to a party um i'm not saying i am agreeing with the fact that you should go to this party but what i'm saying like if you decide to go like your first question is who's going with me yeah right? and if no one goes with you then maybe don't go right mm. uh kind of goes to the boundaries that you're setting um and and what i mean who's going with me like another believer mm -hmm. that you can hold each other accountable because like you said when you go to something like that temptation is going to come up and it's, it's it's going to be real and so yeah. if you have somebody with you ideally you may not fall into temptation uh as quickly uh, yeah. or at all uh and the second thing is just be smart mm. practice wisdom for example going back to the party illustration you go to a party and there's underage people drinking probably a good idea that you should leave right like like you may not want to be seen mm. in that sort of reality mm -hmm. and so just kind of be careful there's illegal things taking place or there's mm -hmm. drugs taking place just maybe a step away right like yeah. and also like you don't have to be there till two or three in the morning like just go for a little bit hang out be present uh make some friends get to know some people you know show up whatever um but also just practice wisdom of, of what you're doing mm -hmm. right and so just kind of being wise and being careful uh, and definitely consider like, all right, who's going with me? Mm, so. Right. Yeah. That's and I, I mean, I go back to what Megan said that because what you're saying reminds me of being on mission. Like mm -hmm. if you already go into something wise, um, a situation that, you know, like, well, all my church friends aren't going to be there um, where I'm going or, um, you know, where, who this person I'm hanging out with, I know what they like to do. Um, it's just go into everything you do that you're on mission. Like yeah. you're um, you know, you are a representation of Jesus. So live that out. Um, last couple things before we close out, but what is the scripture that you all, um, personally hold on to, to, uh, remind you of how to love somebody that's different than mm -hmm. you? Um, and what are some last like encouragements for somebody that's really wanting to take that step out into culture, but just kind of afraid and not yeah. sure how to do that? What you got, Megan? So I thought of, did we repeat the question again? This is how how to, how you love somebody like a oh, yes. verse that, that I thought of uh, John, uh, chapter four, uh, the woman at the well. Um, Stole my answer. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I I love this passage so much, mm. but I think it shows how you love. Um, Ages didn't call her out in such a way that made her feel shameful. He called her out in a way that made her want to run away from it. Um, and he showed her so much love in that whole story. There was like, hey, like, let me come next to you and let me walk with you. Like, let me tell you that maybe what you're doing isn't the best way and I know a better way. Um, it was coming, meeting her where she was at. It wasn't having her meet her, meet her where he was at and calling her, like saying I'm holier than you. It was like, let's come together and let me walk you through this. Um, and so I just thought of that because I think that's how we're supposed to love the people of the world. We don't go up to them and automatically call them for what their sin is mm -hmm. um, or shame them for what they're doing. They're seen in the eyes of, of God. Um, I mean, whenever we're preparing for the uh, New York City mission, uh, Danny always says that in New York, they're all images of God. And that's how you should see them when you're going on that mission trip. Um, and so I think that's how you should see the people of the culture when you're trying to love them. They're, they're God's children. He created them and he has a purpose for them and they just don't know it. And you so happen to be a vessel for that kingdom. 
um, for the kingdom of God. So that responsibility is on you in a sense of to show them that they are ch- called higher um, and they're called to be a daughter or son of the king of kings. Um, so yeah, that the woman of the well was the first thing that came to my mind. It, it's what I hold on to because it shows perfectly example of what it means to love someone and to come at their level um, and to show them that they're on a path of destruction, but how can I lead you to better? And also at least to chain reaction of faith. Like immediately after that, she had that whole conversation with Jesus, she went and told others about what just happened. Um, when we go and love the people of the culture and there's an impact of Christ being centered there, they're probably gonna go and tell other people. Mm. They're probably gonna go and tell their non-believer friends. They're probably gonna tell those who are outcasted. Um, and that just sets a, a chain reaction of faith of, man, someone just told me about the gospel. I cannot not want to share this. I have to feel like I have to share this. That's what the gospel does to you. It it raises a fire in you. you I, I just, I can't just sit with this because I know what's at stake. Um, and I, it, it leads to a beautifully chained reaction. So I would say encouragement, don't be afraid of what may happen. You may get rejected, but that's okay because Jesus was rejected. Um, and look at the p- impact that happened. Mm. Um, and also in Deuteronomy 31, eight, um, it talks about how God will go before you. He's on your side. He mm. wants to walk into that fire with you. He wants to be there in that walk with you when you're going with non-believers. He's not leaving you. Mm. He's not forsaken you. He's there with you. So know that you, there's no reason to be afraid in that conversation or whatever may occur when you're when you're talking to someone who doesn't know the faith. Um, those fears are going to come in because the enemy wants that conversation to stop. Um, but know that the God who defeated the Goliath, the God who defeated um, the enemy, the one who defeated the the pro the prowling a line of this world he is on your side and he Mm -hmm. has gone before you and he has prepared those steps for you um so know that you're not doing it alone because you're never alone because he has not forsaken you Mm, that's good bars shoot i don't even know if i can talk anymore after that that was crazy uh one day you will be the young adult pastor i'm just prophesying that (laughs) so um that was really good um Matthew nine thirty six comes to me. Uh, Jesus had compassion on the people. Like you, mm. you look at mm-hmm. Jesus, and he was constantly going after people who everybody either quit on or was trying to quiet down. And so, uh, even disciples did it. Like when when the dude who was born blind, he's like calling out to Jesus. They're like, shh, like quit talking. And Jesus, is like bring him over here, right? And so he's always looking at the people that everyone's trying mm. to quit or quiet. Um, and then just kind of personally uh, for me, uh, Genesis chapter one. Uh, there's a pattern in Genesis. It's a very poetic, um, you know, of, of God creating the world. Uh, but the the pattern is God formed and then God filled. Mm. God formed, then God filled. So just mm. laying it out. God formed the earth and then he filled it with plants and animals. God mm. formed the sky mm. and he filled it with stars and planets. God formed the sea. He filmed it with living creatures in the sea, right? And so what we believe is that if God created us, if God formed us, then he needs to be the one to continue to form us, right? Uh, and, and fill us with more of himself. And mm. what we allow ourselves to do often is we allow the culture to be what forms us. Mm. And so, uh, so if you believe that God has formed you, then allow him to uh, also continue to fill you and form you into the image of Christ. That's good. Um, and um, yeah, um, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit uh, our comforter. Mm-hmm. Mm. So if we're going to experience the Holy Spirit as our comforter, then we need to be in uncomfortable situations mm. uh, in order to allow the Spirit to be our comforter. That's mm. good. That's yeah. good. For me, um, I I guess like, I mean, it's just, you know, I wrote the question, but I wanted the Holy Spirit to just kind of lead me somewhere. But what, what came to mind for me that has been a comfort as I feel like I've come across more believers that have been hard to love quote unquote um and so when it comes to you know like believers maybe dipping into the culture a little bit too much you know and then i'm having to have those hard conversations with them um i just i thought of luke 23 starting in verse 34 um when jesus is brought up to the mountain where the other criminals were at uh to be hung on the cross he he said father please forgive them Mm. they do not know what they're doing and that might not seem right away like a verse that would help you love people um because he says he's talking to his father he's Mm. not even talking to the people that are around him he Mm. said i don't think any words to the people that were taunting him and completely torturing his body um but 
his words that the words that he utters to his father is forgive them and i think that forgiveness is one of the greatest ways that you can love someone um when you are friends with unbelievers there's going to be hurt that mm. follows with that because you are dealing with people that don't understand mm -hmm the gospel that you are following that you are living out and i've had to deal with that more than once and so it feels very difficult to be around people that don't understand that don't have the capacity of the holy spirit the wisdom that the lord would would give you they don't carry that mm -hmm. so um there's going to be a lot of forgiveness that comes with that that's mm -hmm. how you love people that are yeah. different than you is by saying not necessarily to them but speaking to your father every day for strength yeah father forgive them they they don't know what they're doing until he allows them to open their eyes until they open up their heart to understand then they will understand then they will know um what they're doing and how it affects their life the mm. damages the the you know the the bad culture that they are allowing to yeah. fester in their yeah. life um and so that kind of comforts me because it's it's jesus mm. you know he looked up and saw two criminals where he does not belong and he said forgive them they mm. they don't know what they're doing mm. and then continuing on in that same paragraph in that same passage um my dad always gets super emotional when he thinks of this um this part of the bible but when jesus is finally up there um with the other criminals one criminal is saying um you know you're the savior of the world you yeah. can get yourself out of here yeah. you can get us out of here like why don't you know calling him out and tempting him the same way that the enemy did when jesus started his ministry mm -hmm. um but the other criminal says like do you not fear god mm he is up here with us when we're the ones that are guilty and mm. he is innocent and in that moment that criminal professed belief without even thinking that he did mm. because then he goes on to tell jesus like think of me when you go to paradise yeah. and and that very innocent pure belief i think jesus saw that and of course jesus tells him like you are going with me mm. we're going together um so that that encouragement i hope encourages you all that when it does get hard when you are trying to not live a balance because it shouldn't be a balance it should always be 100 percent jesus but um when you are trying to live out your calling and in uncomfortable situations um let forgiveness and grace be every word uh on your mouth so I hope that this was um, encouraging, uplifting, um, also empowering and hopefully challenging as well um, for our young adults to go out and get uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shin's plug. Yeah. Um, if y'all haven't, go tune into Megan's uncomfortable series uh, on this podcast. It's really, really good. She has some very wise guests, but she also um, brings an insight for young adults to live out their calling in an uncomfortable way. Um, and so we love y'all. This was a really great episode, and I'm so excited for what's to come. Uh, share this with somebody that that needs it yeah if you need it then listen to it again <laughs> all right love y'all see you bye. soon love y'all bye